Last week, John Green in Crash Course World History talked about the Vikings. And it was a really good presentation of the Viking era, but he forgot a teeny tiny thing. <laughs> The Viking Era, starting with the attack on Lindisfarne in the 700s and ending with Christianity winning the battle for the souls of the Scandinavians in the 1100s. And in between that, mostly raping and pillaging, right? Well, no, that wasn't it at all. But if you need a brush up on the bigger picture of the Viking era, you can just watch the Crash Course episode I talked about earlier. I'll put links here, there, link, and in the description box. So, what was it John Green forgot? Did he perhaps not remember to remind people of the lack of horned helmets? Or perhaps that there were more trading than pillaging Vikings. No, he remembered that. What he didn't remember was there were also women Vikings. But first, let's think about the word Viking for a while. We don't really know what it means or where it comes from. But it seems like it was used in connection with all the travelling the Scandinavians did in this era. They talked about, roughly translated, go Viking. But it might be so that the word actually only applies to the travellers that actually did some kind of fighting. There is a debate going on today about how many of the Vikings actually were women. Because we do know from some graves and things like that, that there were warrior women. But any level-headed archaeologist or historian keeps cool in this question. Yes, there were women graves with weaponry in them. But that number is still very small and we don't really know what that means either. The weapons could be just ceremonial. But with this reasoning around the word Viking, there weren't actually many Vikings in the Viking era. Most travellers went on their long journeys to trade. These were journeys from which they couldn't be sure to ever come home again. But if they did, they could be ridiculously rich and live as a king or a queen for the rest of their lives. And nowadays we also know that there were quite a lot of women who also took on this kind of trading journey. But if we want to find large numbers of travelling women... It seems that the best place to look is among the Vikings settling in other parts of the world. Among the Viking settlers in Ireland, France and Russia, there seem to have been quite a lot of women. And the women could be settling on their own, not just as a part of a man's company of cattle and luggage and thralls. But so far we have only been talking about the ones who went travelling. What about the ones who stayed at home? Even if they perhaps couldn't be called Vikings, due to the former definition of the word, they still lived in the Viking era. And as anyone must realise there were about the same amount of men and women living in Scandinavia at this time. And what were their lives like? Well, the Viking era ends the Iron Age, so they were actually late Iron Age farmers. They lived in a very diverse area where the people living in what's today's Denmark and the southern parts of Sweden and Norway grew wheat and rye and kept some animals. 
But in the northern part, it was more difficult to grow cereal crops. For them, the animals were even more important. And they probably also had to depend more on hunting and fishing. But they did trade within the area as well. The northerners probably bought rye and hazelnuts and things like that. And they paid for that with fur and birds and fish that weren't available further down south. The woman's role in the Viking society constantly changed and due to new archaeological finds and new interpretations we constantly have to kind of rethink what we always thought about this era. But we also have to remember that the women we see in the archaeological studies mostly are the wealthy ones. This is Estrid. Since she's mentioned on rune stones and her grave was found, we know quite a lot about her, actually. Her face has been reconstructed over her skull, so this is probably very close to what she actually looked like. But there weren't that many women as notable as Estrid. The poor farmer's wives, or the servants, or the thralls, well, that's the Norse version of slaves, they didn't have rune stones risen by or for them. They didn't have pompous burials in which we can see all of the stuff that they got with them in death. So for now we'll have to stay with the women. We do know the wealthy ones. There are hundreds of rune stones mentioning women, either risen by them or for them. These were women of some power in society. The symbol of her power was the keys. The lady of the house was the one who had the keys to all the storages. And this has been seen as kind of a lesser power than the man's more official out-of-home power. In many older studies, they even see the keys just as a symbol, not as something really important. But in later literature, they talk about the power of the keys as something very real. With the keys, she was in control of the food. And in these times, that was the task of a commander. They lived off the land and ever so often the land decided to have their crops fail. If they did... It was up to her to see to it that the food they had lasted them until next year. But the power of the food wasn't really as domestic as we might think. And as it became later in history, the one who controlled the food had real political power. The way the spaces were used, both public and private, differs a lot from how we think about them today. The home wasn't as private as we presume, and official meetings could be held in the same room where the family actually was sleeping. So, the home was an official place, and food was a big part of every occasion. It also had its part in religious ceremonies, so the lady of the house had some power there as well. There were no real priesthood in these times. Well, there were the people who kept the temple. The Gothi, if it was a man, and the Githia, if it was a woman. But these weren't really priests. Well, they did conduct the sacrificial feasts that were held in their temple. But these feasts were something everyone could manage in their homes. These people just happened to be the people that took care of the temples, which also served as a communal hall, by the way. The Viking Age also had the völva, the magically skilled women. But I do talk quite a lot about them in my video on priestesses, so I will not do it now. But I will link that video here and in the description box. The picture we get when we try to study women of the Viking Age is really all over the place. We go all the way from the image of the strong, self-sufficient woman 
living in a society where she is more or less equal to men, to, to this. Total bimbo. Why do they call these Viking women? There's absolutely nothing Viking about them. Well, I could agree to call them fantasy warrior women, but never Vikings. Under what conditions should you live to be comfortable in these clothes? Well, let's imagine her in Scandinavia, in summertime. Can you see her running around here? Oops, sorry. Her horns got all tangled up in the branches and twigs here. And imagine how much that fur would itch when you got sweaty under it, which you undoubtedly would get. These are much more practical outfits for summertime. But fur, it's good for wintertime, isn't it? It is. But your clothes kind of have to cover your body to do any good in the cold. Also, her high heels would make it completely impossible to move around in the snow. This is how to get around in winter time. But frankly, I think that the picture of the totally independent woman is almost as misleading as this bimbo one. Yes, there were powerful and independent women in the Viking era in Scandinavia. But as I said earlier, we then talk about the wealthiest few. Most people had to struggle to survive. And regular women who weren't rich or skilled tradespersons probably would have said that they live in quite a patriarchal society. They didn't have the right to vote and their judicial safety depended on their place in the social hierarchy. For instance, if a woman got raped, the abuser got different punishments depending on who she was. And if she was a thrall, he of course didn't get punished at all. The pictures of the women of the Viking era are being influenced by the prevailing gender pictures. So far, the man has always been the norm, the foundation on which we stand to look out on history. We are talking about tradesmen and boatsmen and swordsmen. But now, with Viking women buried in ships, with scales and weights, used in trading, and at times even with swords in their graves. The male norm seems a bit stale, doesn't it? I hope you learned something new today. See you soon, I hope. Bye! <laughs>